we know that there are three methods of security analysis. The first one is fundamental analysis. They believe that they can study the information regarding the economy, industry, and company, and find out an intrinsic value, which is the true value of the security. So whenever an information comes into the market, they believe that the intrinsic value will help them to identify the true value of that security. So whatever is the market price right now, that will change and it will become the same as the intrinsic value. And there will be a time for this adjustment to take place, right? If the intrinsic value is higher than the market value, then it's going to take some time before the actual current price is going to rise up to the intrinsic price. And during that time, the fundamental analyst will make a buy or sell decision and earn their profit. In the same way, if the intrinsic price is lower than the market price, then it's going to take some time before the market price comes down to the level of the intrinsic value. So again, they're going to make a profit by making the right decision after calculating the intrinsic value. So this is how fundamental analysts made a buy or sell decision in order to get profits by trading in securities. Now the second method is technical analysis. The technical analysts, they believed that the study of past prices will help them to predict the future prices. They believe that the prices were moving in a pattern and these patterns repeat themselves. The third one is efficient market hypothesis. It was formerly known as random walk theory. So let's see what is random walk theory. This random walk theory negates both fundamental analysis and technical analysis. They say that fundamental analysis and technical analysis are not going to help you to earn any sort of a profit in trading in securities because this theory states that whatever information, let it be regarding the economy, industry, or company, whatever information is there, it will be immediately made available to the investors. And so everyone's going to make the same decision. So the theory negates fundamental analysis. They are saying that information about the economy, industry, and company is not going to help you to earn a superior return. They are against the um, fundamental analysis. The second point under this random walk theory is that they say whatever piece of information that comes into the market, uh, that is going to be reflected in the price immediately. There is no time gap in adjusting to that price, uh, adjusting to that new piece of information. It is immediately uh, reflected in the stock prices. And the prices of securities is dependent upon the new pieces of information. If it's a price, if it's a positive piece of information, the price is immediately going to rise up to a new level. If the information is a negative one, the price is immediately going to fall down to another level. And they're saying that this previous price is not going to help you to predict the future prices because price movements are independent of past price movements. The current price movements are moving independently and they're not dependent upon past price movements. At the same time, these price movements, the current price movements is dependent on new pieces of information. Whenever a new piece of information comes, it's going to change. But that does not mean there's a relation between the past price and the current price. They are completely independent of each other. So the random walk theory negates the technical analysis as well. So the, the uh, random walk theory is mainly focused on the hypothesis that the markets are efficient. What do you mean by the term market is efficient? The term efficient here means the markets immediately and quickly reflect the uh, changes in the price because of information. Uh, that is, whenever a new piece of information comes into the market, the market adjusts very quickly and a new price level is set. That is what they mean by the market is efficient. Market is efficient means everyone has got access to information regarding the stocks and the 
information is completely reflected in the prices immediately. There is no time lag in um, adjusting to the new piece of information. So there is no possibility of earning a superior return if you have a new piece of information because everybody has got access to that information and the prices are going to immediately adjust to the next level. That is why this theory came to be known as efficient market hypothesis or the efficient market model. So random walk theory is just the former name of EMH. Right now it is known as efficient market hypothesis or efficient market model because this is based on the hypothesis that markets are generally efficient. So efficient market hypothesis um, holds the view that in an efficient market, new information is processed and evaluated as it arrives and prices immediately adjust to the new and correct level. Consequently, an investor cannot consistently earn excess returns by undertaking fundamental So the efficient market hypothesis is of the opinion that an investor cannot earn excess returns by undertaking either fundamental analysis or technical analysis because whatever piece of information uh, that enters the market is immediately processed, evaluated, and it is instantaneously adjusted to the new price. There are three forms of market efficiency under the efficient market hypothesis. They, they consider that the market is efficient in three forms. The first one is a weak form, the second is semi-strong form, and the third one is the strong form. Under the weak form of market efficiency, they are of the opinion that the information regarding past sequence of security price movements are already reflected in the stock market prices, the current prices. The semi-strong form of market efficiency states that not only the past prices, but the publicly available information is also incorporated into current prices. The strong form of market efficiency state that all information, both public and private information, is adjusted in the current prices. So let's see each form in detail. See, they put forward three hypotheses, right? That the market is efficient in the weak form, in the semi-strong form, and the strong form. So in order to prove this hypothesis as true, they have to carry out various tests, right? So what are the different tests to be carried out in order to prove that the weak form efficiency exists or the weak form efficiency is true? So what is the weak form efficiency? It states that what all past information is already reflected in the current price and therefore the study of past price is not going to be of any help to you. So this, uh, the, first, the weak form of efficiency directly repudiates the technical analysis. They're saying the technical analysis is not going to help you in any way. So um, price changes are dependent upon new pieces of information. Whenever a new piece of information comes into the uh, market, then the price is going to change. And the price movements are completely random. And the study of past prices is not going to help you in predicting the future sequence of prices. That is what the weak form efficiency states. It is repudiating or it directly negates the technical analysis. So what are the different tests under the weak form efficiency? The first test is serial correlation test. Under the serial correlation test, the correlation coefficient is calculated. That is, the price changes of one period is will form one set, and the price changes of the same stock in another period will also be considered. And then we'll see whether there is any correlation between these two prices. We are taking one stock for the study, and we'll study the price changes in one period and the price changes in another period of the same stock. And we are trying to see whether there is any correlation between these two price changes. Now the correlation coefficient, when we calculate the correlation coefficient, we can get a value of from which ranges from negative one to positive one. If you're getting a positive number as the answer, as the correlation coefficient, 
then it means that there is a direct relation between the prices of two period of the same stock. If the value is a negative one, then it means there's an inverse relation between the prices of two period. That is when one price changes, the other one decreases. When the first price falls, the second one increases. So there's a going to be an inverse relation between the price changes of two period. If the value is zero, it means there is no relation between the prices of both period. So in order to prove the weak form efficiency as true, when we are calculating the correlation coefficient, the number should come to a value that is close to zero. If the coefficient correlation is close to zero, then it means that there is no relation between the prices. The prices are serially independent and therefore the weak form efficiency can be proven as true. They state that there is no relation between the past price and the current price. So if we calculate the correlation coefficient of two period of the same stock and we find that the answer is zero. If the correlation coefficient is close to zero, then it means that's right. There is no relation between the past and present price. Then it will be proven that the weak form efficiency is true. Second test is run test. See, in the weak form, we calculated the absolute price change, right? The absolute value of the price was calculated. What was the value of the price? What was the price change? But under run test, we are not concerned about the absolute value. We are only concerned about the direction of the change. We do not, do not want to know whether the price came from 55 to 50 to 42 or whether it rose from 40 to 45 to 50. What we want to know is the direction of the change. See, if the, there was an increase in the price, then it will be represented by a positive sign. If there was a decrease in the price, then it will be represented as a negative sign. And if there is no change in price, it is represented by zero. For example, let's see, uh, I'm stating that the prices of a particular period for a particular stock is 50, 50, 45, 35, okay? So how many runs are going to be there? What is a run? A consecutive sequence of same sign is considered as a run. <laughs> so as per my example, the first price was 50, and second again, the second day was 50, it remained 50. So the first run is zero. There has been no change between the two prices, so the first run is zero. Then 50, 50, 45. Then third price was 45. The price fell down by 5. So it shows that there was a negative change. So we're going to represent the second run as negative. And then the third run, it came to 35. It fell further down. So again, it's going to come to negative. So these two negatives will form a run. And the first zero will form another run. So there are two runs in that series. So there was 50, 50, 45, 35. Now if the next price is somewhere that falls between um, say 46, then there's a positive run. So the, if it fits in the same direction, as long as the change is in the same direction, that will be considered as a single run and we'll calculate the number of runs in each sequence. In run test, actual number of runs observed in a series of stock price moment is compared with the number of runs in a randomly generated number series. So what they do is that they will calculate the runs of a series of stock price moments. And then they will just randomly create a lot of numbers and then study the runs in that number also. And they'll compare both. If there is no significant difference between the, both these, then the security price changes are considered to be random in nature because I randomly picked some numbers and I studied the number of runs in that. And then I pick the stock price changes and study the number of runs in that. And if the, both these series have got almost the similar number of runs, then it means the stock price moments change randomly. There is no relation. So the next one is filter test. So what is filter test? It is used as uh, a measure to buy or sell a particular security. See, according to the filter rule, what we generally believe, what we generally believe is that there is a support line and the resistance line, right? So till a new piece of information enters into the market, 
the price is going to fluctuate between the support and the resistance line. That is, there will be a lower price and there will be a higher price. Suppose the lower price is 45 and the higher price is 50. Then the price is going to keep on fluctuating between this 45 and 50. Now, once the price breaks the 50 level, it means the price is going to increase. And if the price falls below the 45 level, it means some new information has come and uh, the, it has inversely affected the stock price. The price is going to fall down further. It's going to fall lower than 45. So that is a filter rule. So they will make a decision as when to buy and when to sell. See, for example, as per the filter rule, uh, purchase a stock when it rises by X percent from the previous low. See, it was 45. But when I see that the prices, sorry, the prices was uh, 50, it was not moving above 50. But then I see that the price has now reached 52 or 53. Then I say, okay, go and buy that security because then it's going to increase further. If the price falls down below 45, then the possibility is that the price, the price is going to fall further. So it's best to sell it off. So likewise, there's another example is purchase the stock when it rises by X percent from the previous low and sell it when it declines by X person from the subsequent high. So I can set a uh, limit, right? So when it crosses the limit, make a sell decision, or when it crosses another limit, sell, make the buy decision. Now this filters can range from 1% to 50%. Whatever is the change that you want, you can keep that as a filter. So under the filter test, the returns earned by an investor by try trading according to the filter rule are compared with the returns earned by following buy and hold strategy. What is buy and hold strategy? It is a passive strategy where you just purchase the securities, hold it for a long period or till the maturity date and then sell it off. So under the filter test, we'll compare the returns earned by engaging in filter rule and also by uh, engaging in buy and hold strategy. If the filter rule, if, we, if the trading with filters results in superior returns, that is, we are able to earn higher returns by following the filter rule, then it means that there is a hmm, pattern in the price movements and therefore the weak form will be negated. In order to prove the weak form hypothesis as true, even after applying the filter rule, we must not be able to earn superior returns. If so, then we can see that the weak form efficiency is a true hypothesis. Now, the next one is distribution pattern. See, there's a rule in statistics that the distribution of random numbers will form, it will come up to a normal distribution. You know what the uh, graphical representation of a normal distribution is, right? You will get a bell-shaped curve when you plot out the, the random numbers in a chart. If price changes are random like weak form efficient market suggested, suggested, then the distribution should also be a normal distribution. So under this test, the distribution of price changes can be studied to test the randomness or otherwise of stock price moments. So when we are plotting out random numbers in a chart and we are getting a bell-shaped or normal distribution, then it means that the price changes are random in nature and it will prove that the weak form EMH is true. So these are the different tests under the weak form of market efficiency. The second form is the semi-strong form efficiency. Under the semi-strong form, they say that not only are the past prices reflected in the current price, but all publicly available information is also immediately reflected in the current price. So what is publicly available information? Whatever information is available to the public in the form of uh, published financial reports or in the form of articles or journals or anything that gives an information about the company that you're dealing in. So all publicly made available information will also be reflected in the prices. Examples like annual reports, company announcements, press releases, announcement of coming dividends, etc. Okay. Now, I said the weak form negates technical analysis. They said there is no use in studying the past prices because the price movements are completely random in nature. They are dependent only on new pieces of information. The semi-strong form efficiency negates fundamental analysis. How do fundamental analysts earn a profit? 
they will calculate the intrinsic value they will see what's the current price and then they expect the current price to come up to the intrinsic value before that price adjusts to the level of the intrinsic value they are going to make a trading decision and earn a profit from that but what semi strong form efficiency states is that whenever that information arrives in the market the price will immediately move to the next level maybe it will move upwards maybe it will down, move downwards according to the piece of information which enters the market but the change will be immediate there is not going to be any time gap for adjustment of the price therefore the fundamental analyst cannot make any sort of a profit by calculating the intrinsic value and comparing with the current price so so it's immediate it repudiates the fundamental analysis now the test of semi strong hypothesis helps to i mean it attempts to establish whether share prices react precisely and quickly to new items of information so what the test under this type of hypothesis tries to prove is that whether the price immediately adjusts to new price new piece of information they will also try to see whether analysts fundamental analysts are able to earn superior returns by utilizing publicly available information are they able to earn superior returns and do prices immediately adjust to the next level if it doesn't then it is proven wrong then this hypothesis will prove as wrong so for this hypothesis to be proven as true the prices should quickly adjust to the next level whenever an information enters the market and the fundamental analyst should not be able to earn any sort of a superior returns by using the publicly available information so as part of the test under semi strong hypothesis they will calculate the actual return and the expected return and they will see whether there is they will calculate the difference between the actual return and expected return and see whether any excess return has been earned if there is no excess return earned or the return earned is close to zero then it means the semi strong form of emh is true that is known as going to earn superior returns by utilizing publicly available information that is what semi strong form of emh tries to prove so when we are calculating an actual return and expected return and then seeing whether any excess return has been made and we come to the uh, conclusion that there has been no excess returns then it means that the semi strong form emh is true so the weak form tests were carried out by many scientists and they came to the conclusion that the weak form hypothesis is true the prices do move randomly and past prices are not going to help in predicting the future prices the semi strong hypothesis was also tested out by many famous scientists and it was also proven true Now the third form of efficiency is the test of strong form efficiency under the strong form efficiency they say that not only the past prices the publicly available information and the private information is also immediately reflected in the current market prices so no one is going to be able to earn excess profits by using public information or private information nothing is going to help you in earning a superior return that is what the strong form efficiency for, uh, tries to prove so under the strong form efficiency there are two tests two type of tests the first type of test is to find out whether those who have access to inside information have been able to utilize profitably such inside information to earn excess returns suppose the top level management they are in the board of directors they know they have got access to private information which is available to only those who are inside the business it has not been published yet so those those who are inside the business they have access to inside information and are they able to earn higher returns because they have got knowledge of this private information that is the first test the second one is there are mutual funds right they have got extensive researchers working under them they collect information about the market keep a track of market movements and they have their own information which has been privately generated by them is that information helping them in earning a superior returns that is the two types of test that is done under strong form efficiency the results were see in the first category the inside information they said that 
according to the hypothesis, no one should be able to earn a superior return. But when they tested it out, it was proven that people were actually able to earn superior returns by using in inside information. So that negated this hypothesis to a certain extent. Now the second test was whether mutual funds and investment analysts were able to earn superior returns by using inside information. It was proven that they were not actually able to earn higher returns uh, and therefore it validated the strong form of market efficiency. So it is only, we cannot say the market is completely efficient. We cannot say that strong form hypothesis is completely true because inside information helps in earning superior returns. Only mutual funds and other investment analysts were not able to earn superior returns by using inside information. So it is partially true. That is all we can say. It was proven as partially true. The first two forms were validated and it was considered as true, but the third one is only partially true. This is with regard to efficient market hypothesis. I hope this much is clear. Thank you.